Hello everyone, this is Arirang News. I'm Nae Hyunkyung in Seoul. The top stories we are tracking for you at this hour. Historians in the U.S. protest Japan's efforts to censor some of its past wrongdoing, especially concerning wartime sex slaves. They accuse the Shinzo Abe administration of questioning history. In the wake of the latest cyber attack on Sony Pictures in the U.S., American legislators are pushing to broaden economic sanctions on North Korea. The bill imposes stiffer measures. And Jordan's Air Force launches a new round of airstrikes targeting the Islamic State militant group. This comes a day after Jordanian King Abdullah vows revenge for a Jordanian pilot's death. Now, but first, a group of U.S.-based historians say they are not happy about Japan's attempt to whitewash history. The scholars are protesting against the Abe administration. They say Tokyo tried to pressure a publisher to change how the issue of Japan's wartime sexual slavery is described in one of its history textbooks. Connelly has this story. This is a joint statement scheduled to appear in the March edition of the official periodical of the American Historical Association. A copy of the statement, which was sent to Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, shows 19 American history scholars expressing strong protest against Japan's attempts to suppress statements or water down atrocities in history textbooks, not only in Japan, but also elsewhere in the world. The statement is in response to Japan's efforts to pressure U.S. publisher McGraw-Hill to change how it described its wartime sexual slavery issue in one of its history textbooks shown here. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe claims there are errors in the history book taught in classrooms, with his administration continuing to deny state responsibility for the country's past atrocities. The group of scholars, led by Professor Alex Dutton from the University of Connecticut, say that no government should have the right to censor history, and they accuse the Abe administration of questioning established history and attempting to eliminate references about the country's sexual enslavement of women during World War II. Historians estimate up to 200,000 women, mostly from Korea, were forced to work in brothels for the Japanese military. As a collective statement on a specific historical issue is seen as highly unusual, analysts are now watching how this will affect Abe's relations with the U.S. and his upcoming visit to Washington sometime this spring. Connie Lee, Arirang News. American lawmakers are united in slapping more sanctions on North Korea. A bipartisan bill aiming to broaden current sanctions has been introduced and is likely to enjoy support from both Republicans and Democrats. Connie Kim has the details. U.S. lawmakers are pushing to broaden sanctions on North Korea in the wake of Pyongyang's alleged hack attack on Sony Pictures. U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Ed Roy said Thursday, a new piece of bipartisan legislation aims to prevent North Korea from accessing the hard currency that supports the regime. The bill would allow U.S. officials to freeze assets held in the U.S. of individuals or international companies found to be doing business with the North or who have links to the regime's nuclear program. Those who contributed to the massive cyber attack on Sony Pictures last November would also be targeted. The legislation broadens current sanctions on the North, which are focused on U.S. companies and Americans. A similar bill was passed by the House last year and received in the Senate, but was later scrapped. The bill's passage is more likely this time, as the U.S. has vowed to clamp down on Pyongyang in light of the cyber attack on the Hollywood-based studio. The Senate is also expected to introduce a similar bill. Last month, U.S. President Barack Obama signed an executive order that imposes sanctions against three North Korean organizations and 10 individuals. It was the first time the U.S. had sanctioned any country for a cyber attack and implied more sanctions could be on the way, as the U.S. said at the time it was just the first aspect of the U.S. response. Connie Kim, Arirang News. 
And while those developments are taking place, there is growing speculation that China has and continues to support North Korea's cyber warfare operations. In an article posted online on the U.S.-based conservative magazine Weekly Standard, Dennis Halpin, a visiting scholar at the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins, suggests that Beijing's computer experts even helped North Korea hack Sony Pictures last November. He said Pyongyang's cyber warfare agency, Bureau 121, is based at a hotel in northeast China, close to the border. And North Korea's nearly 2,000-member elite cyber hacking team are actually trained in China. The scholar adds that it seems highly unlikely that a major North Korean intelligence operation exists in China without China's knowledge and approval. Meanwhile, North Korea's total grain production last year reached its highest level since the beginning of the regime's economic collapse in the mid-1990s. According to the United Nations World Food Program and Food and Agriculture Organization, North Korea's total grain production, which includes rice, corn and beans, amounted to nearly 5 million tons in 2014. Now that's 130,000 tons more than its total production the year before. Data shows that the regime's food production has been gradually increasing ever since Kim Jong-un came into power in 2011. However, North Korea is still short on the grain needed to maintain the bare minimum necessary for its people due to decreased international aid and losses in productivity from floods and famine. So North Korea remains a tough country to invest in as it's extremely hard to predict what will happen in the reclusive state. Yet, the regime continues to seek much needed foreign investment. Arirang News' Hwang Sung-hee takes a look at how the world's most closed economy is trying to make money. It's constant military provocations, threats and dangerous brinkmanship over its nuclear program make North Korea the least attractive place for business. But some say the regime is opening up to draw much-needed foreign investment, for example, in tourism. There is now a growing trade in tourism from the Netherlands to North Korea. So the North Korean government is now inviting Dutch students to go to Pyongyang to give Dutch language training to the North Korean tour guides. Around 100,000 tourists visit this untrodden corner of the world every year, and North Korea says it aims to raise that number to one million. For that, it has set up opulent new ventures like the Masingnyang Ski Resort. Korea Tours, a Western travel agency that organizes trips to the north, says the regime is enthusiastic about its program proposals most of the time. A lot of projects that we've been working on that have become possible in the last three years or so are things we were working on beforehand. But North Korea's unpredictability is troubling. The regime banned tourists last October on Ebola fears, with no signs of lifting it anytime soon. In fact, North Korea was placed at the very bottom of the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom, with a score of 1.3 points out of 100. That's over 70 points behind South Korea and nearly 30 points below Cuba, which came second to last on the list. So it doesn't pro provide any meaningful uh, consistency in terms of policy. And also North Korea remains, many factors in North Korea are unknown. So I think that's the key risky factor for the investors. Experts say North Korea's handling of the inter-Korean Kaesong industrial complex with its frequent changes in regulations and unilateral shutdowns is a good example of its uncertainty. Despite the problem, trade between the two countries hit a record 2.3 billion U.S. dollars last year, thanks to growing output in the joint business park. Given the lack of resources and capital, experts say Pyongyang must open up and reform its antiquated economic system. That's the only way to improve the daily lives of North Koreans. But first, North Korea will have to end its confrontation with the outside world over its nuclear program. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. 
Top diplomats from South Korea, Japan, and China are expected to meet next month in what will be their first such trilateral meeting in three years. A senior official at Seoul's foreign ministry says the three continues, uh, or the three countries rather, are discussing the possibility of holding minister-level talks in Seoul at the end of March. Now, this is noteworthy as the country's annual high-level diplomatic exchanges had been hampered by territorial issues and Japan's denials of its historical wrongdoing. Pundits say the upcoming meeting could also serve as an opportunity for separate bilateral talks on other pending issues among the three ministers. Now, the debate over tax versus welfare is heating up the political front in Korea. Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan says he is against raising taxes at the moment because it will fuel deflationary pressure on the economy. Hwang Ji-hae reports. Now is not the time to talk about a tax hike. That's what Korean Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan said on Thursday at the National Assembly. He said raising taxes will lead to shrinking domestic demand under the current economic conditions, stoking concerns over deflation risks. Che added, however, that if a tax increase was to happen, it could only be through public consensus. The minister is sticking with President Pakane's campaign pledge to provide more welfare while keeping tax revenues fixed. And to do so, the government pledged Thursday to make its financial structure more efficient by cutting out overlapping welfare programs and raising transparency in local finances. The finance ministry said it will first merge or discard 600 redundant welfare programs. The move to streamline finances looks inevitable as Korea is expected to post a tax deficit for the fourth straight year in 2015. This amid calls for broader welfare in a country that has one of the fastest aging population with low birth rates. The finance ministry estimates last year's revenue shortfall will stand at over 11 trillion won or roughly 10 billion U.S. dollars. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. In the year 2012, for Korea was added to record household. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Na Hyung Kyung, live from Seoul. Shopping market thinks the true meaning of creation shines through. Now, Jordan is following through its promise for revenge on the Islamic State militant group on Thursday, launching waves of airstrikes on some of the militant group's key positions in northern Syria. The small Arab nation, still reeling from the brutal murder of one of its pilots, says there's much more to come. Kwan Soa reports. This is just the beginning is what Jordan's military vowed after launching its first airstrikes against Islamic State since the extremists released a video this week showing Jordanian pilot Muath al qasasbe being burned alive in a cage. Jordan's army expressed its will on state television to take revenge on the militant group, showing footage of dozens of warplanes bombing what appeared to be munitions bases and training camps in northern Syria. Tens of Royal Jordanian Air Force aircraft launched consecutive airstrikes to demolish strongholds and holes of the terror organization Islamic State. Iraqi media reports more than 50 IS militants were killed, including a senior commander. After the raid, the fighter jets flew over the hometown of the deceased pilot as Jordan's King Abdullah was visiting the pilot's grieving family. Kasaspe's father, a key member of a powerful tribe in Jordan, reportedly said he got King Abdullah's word that his son's death would be avenged. On the day the gruesome execution video was released, he said the Jordanian government must take action. Jordan's airstrikes were the first since the pilot's capture in December brought them to a halt. Jordan is part of the U.S.-led coalition against Islamic State, but there is still a political divide within the country as to how much Jordan should be involved in this fight. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. The leaders of Germany and France are working together to ease tensions in eastern Ukraine, where the fighting between rebels and Russia-backed separatists is still happening. After making a surprise trip to Kiev, the two plan to visit Moscow with a peace proposal. For this report, here's Son Jung-in. 
The leaders of Germany and France have proposed a new peace initiative for Ukraine, raising hopes of a breakthrough in the year-old conflict pitting Kiev against separatist rebels in eastern Ukraine. Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande said they have worked together to draft a proposal based on Ukraine's territorial integrity and hope it will be acceptable to both sides in the conflict. The high-level diplomatic maneuver is seen as an apparent bid to head off U.S. consideration of lethal military aid for the Ukrainian government in its war against the Russian-backed separatists. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who had arrived in Kiev earlier, met with Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko and other top officials to affirm U.S. support for a diplomatic resolution to the conflict. Kerry also urged Moscow to show its commitment to a peaceful solution and to cease its military support for the separatists, an allegation that Russia strongly denies. Fierce fighting has flared again in the region in recent weeks, with rebels advancing on a railway hub held by Ukrainian troops after launching an offensive that scuppered a five-month-old ceasefire. According to the United Nations, the fighting has claimed more than 5,000 lives since April last year, including some 220 civilians killed in just the past three weeks. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. In the meantime, Russia's inflation rate hit its highest level in 16 years last month due to the weakening ruble. Russia's statistics service Rostat says January's inflation rate amounted to 3.9 percent compared to 2.6 percent a month before. Now, this is the highest pace of inflation in Russia since February 1999 when consumer prices grew by 4 percent in one month. January's rate was also considerably higher than Rostat's forecast of 2.7 percent and Economist's outlook of 2.6. Now, the figures come just days after the country's central bank cut its main interest rate from 17 percent to 15 percent, citing stabilizing inflation. We're coming up on one of the Korea's one of Korea's biggest holidays, the Lunar New Year, which means that some local films will once again be battling for the big holiday crowds. Our film critic Pierce Conran joins us today to tell us about this year's films and how they might fare at the box office. Good to see you again, Pierce. Good afternoon. So first off, which films will be battling it out for the Lunar New Year this year? Uh, well, normally there's quite a few films at this period, but uh, actually there's a few less than usual this time around. Mm. And so we have two. Those are the, um, the period set kind of a music bio romance called Ceci Bon, which is a French word, which means it's so good. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Showbox's period action comedy sequel called Detective K Secret of the Lost Island, which follows the 2011 original, which was subtitled Secrets of the Virtuous Widow. Um, so Lunar New Year is a very big time for, uh, especially for families to come to the theaters, and normally we do see uh, a number of very big hits. But um, last year they, they had four films, the four major studios each put out a film, but only one of them broke out. So perhaps it's a case of uh, studios being a little wary of uh, of, uh, of returns this time, so we've only got two this time around. Mm -hmm. So before we get to the details of those uh, two films, why do you think then uh, the Lunar New Year holiday is such a big time for studios to release their films? Well, it's considered traditionally one of the four major um, one of the peak theater times uh, of the year. Those other ones, of course, are the, the high summer period when the schools are off for a few weeks, and then there's the Chuseok holiday, mm -hmm. the Thanksgiving holiday, and then the end of year period, just right around, uh, right around uh, the other New Year. Um, but uh, in, in the for what's special about uh, Solnal, um, Lunar New Year, is that families come out. Uh, so everyone, everyone's together, and so studios have this opportunity to program uh, kinds of films that might actually bring out large crowds, mm -hmm. uh, not just certain demographics. So they really kind of go for broke and try and get the whole demographic. Um, and so that's why we've seen a few films, like last year there was uh, Miss Granny and the year before that there were Miracle in Cell number 7, which was particularly successful. Huge and, hit. Yeah, huge mm -hmm. hit. And people didn't really see that coming, but in retrospect it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. 
because it was the only film that could uh, really kind of rally the, the whole family. And, uh, but it's, it's not exclusively family fare that works. There have been some other movies. The same year as Miracle in Cell Number 7, we mm -hmm. had spy action thriller, The Berlin File. But that was just a particularly big year where those two films alone got uh, about uh, 20 million admissions. Mm -hmm. And it was certainly not the case like that last year. So we'll see what happens this okay. time. Okay, so let's come back to this year's film. So Ceci Bong, that's one film that I'm really looking forward to. So what can you tell us about that film? Uh, it's indeed, it's a very big release. It's from CJ Entertainment, uh, of course, the biggest studio in Korea. And uh, it's set in the 1960s and takes its name from uh, the Ceci Bong Music Club, which mm -hmm. was a kind of a famous uh, um, folk, uh, uh, folk venue, which kind of served as a birthing ground for a lot of the music that is really considered classic Korean rock at this point. Um, and so we have, um, the, the, there's this group called the Ceci Bong Trio, which comprises two very, very famous musicians, which are, of course, Song Chang Shik and uh, Yun Hyung Ju, who, of course, later would form the folk duo Twin Folio. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the third member, who's actually kind of a fictional character, is played by Jong and he's kind of the lead. And, but all three of them, they fall for uh, a girl who kind of serves as their muse, and that is played by the famous actress Han Yo-ju. Mm -hmm. So do you think the nostalgia factor would work for this film? I've asked my mom, and she really wants to go watch this film. So uh, it's for the parent generation in our cases, I guess. Uh, yes, uh, it's definitely trying to go for everyone. There's a young star to bring in the young people, but of course the period setting uh, is, is there so that we can kind of uh, get the, those older crowds come out. Because uh, so, you know older viewers don't always go to the cinema, but when they do, they go out in a huge numbers. We've seen that recently with Ode to My Father as a good right. example, or perhaps The Attorney not so long ago as well. Um, so we have, there's other examples of that, like you know Architecture 101 or Nameless Gangster that's been going on for a while. Um, and the musicians are a real draw here because everyone loves uh, Twin Folio and uh, people you know, remember that and so uh, that's going to be very important. But the problem for me, uh, having seen the film yesterday, is that this, th this music setting is it's kind of a cheat because uh, you kind of think the movie is going to be really about these musicians mm -hmm. but they're just kind of the background. And it's more of a love story. More about the romance. Right, about characters that weren't actually real characters. So. It remains to be seen how word of mouth will go. The curiosity is high, and people will definitely come out and see it early on. We'll see how it kind of uh, it, it, it continues beyond that. Mm -hmm. All right. At least some portion of the fan base for Chongwu, that he's very popular at the moment. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that fares. But how about Detective K sequel? Do you think um, that will? How does it stack up the original? the previous version? Um, I mean, I'd say it's, it's kind of more of the same. Uh, it's definitely trying to hit the same buttons as it did before. It's, uh, it brings back the same star as Kim Young-min as kind of this, uh, this bumbling but very clever detective and then his sidekick Oh dal uh, a very popular supporting actor. And the story uh, deals with kind of counterfeit silver that gets slipped into the economy during the Joseon era and a number of kidnapped children and how that kind of all comes together. To, to say any more about the plot is kind of pointless because this is kind of a very much an episodic thrill and it's, uh, it's all about setting up um, a big set pieces and a lot of uh, big gags mm -hmm. and just kind of giving uh, Kim Young-min and Oh dal an opportunity to kind of uh, uh, jock around together as, they've, as they did well in the last film. Mm -hmm. And on that, uh, on that count, it's very much you know, more of the same. Mm -hmm. So will it be enough to attract the same crowds, at least for the people who have seen it before? Will they come back and watch the sequel? I certainly think most will. I mean, it's been a four-year gap, so that's, uh, it is actually quite similar, but I think the gap is long enough that people would have mostly forgotten what happened in the first one. Mm -hmm. um, but the only thing is, there, it does take a very dark turn towards the end, which is a little out of keeping, and some people might not like that. But I don't think it'll go so far as to kind of really sink the film, and I do think it'll do quite well. At the same time, Oh dal -soo, who's been you know, in many, many films, in fact, recently he became the first actor to have a filmography of amassing over 100 million admissions, which wow. is quite a feat. Mm -hmm. But um, given Oda, uh, Oats My Father being such a big hit, and he was a really significant part of that, right. I wonder if his presence might actually boost the film a little more than usual. Okay, so which film do you prefer um, out of the two films that we talked about today? Well, personally, uh, I was expecting to like Ceci Bon more. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't like the first Detective K that much. I thought it was, it was okay. The second one, I'm not such a huge fan of it. Uh, you know, I, I see that it's, it works and it totally achieves its aims, but it just didn't really work for me. But I was very, very disappointed with Ceci Bon. Mm -hmm. I loved the music from the period and I thought it was, I felt very, felt very cheated that that's not what, what we got. And what we do have is actually a 
pretty, pretty dull film, in mm. my opinion. And there's this very long coda at the end that goes on forever. But um, uh, they had a good trailer, uh, I guess. Right. And uh, but it, for me, the, the the film is not the trailer, uh, mm, sadly, okay. which happens sometimes. But given at the box office, I think. I would have said Ceci Bon was going to be primed to be the big hit, but now I'm not so sure. I think both will do well, but ultimately Detective K will probably do a little better than its predecessor and probably win out between the two, but I'm not expecting a huge hit like we had in the last two years. Okay, all right. I was torn between which one I would go watch, but I think I have uh, made up my mind. <laughs> I won't tell which one, though. All right, thank you very much, Pierce, for uh, coming in today and sharing your insights. My pleasure. Well, that's it on news for now. I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. Thanks for staying with us. More updates coming up at 4 p.m. Korea time.